Hope is one of those funny words. Hope means significant things, and then hope also kind of means nothing in certain contexts at the same time. Well, I hope this happens to you. I hope you have a good day. I hope you're on your way. I hope you feel well. There has been whole political campaigns built off the word hope, but, but what does that mean? How do we, how do we live in hope? What is the Christian's hope? Now you might ask yourself, say, well, my hope is in Jesus Christ. I put my faith and trust in him. That's, that's good. But do you live in that hope that you profess? Well, how do you know if you're trusting in the hope in Jesus Christ? Well, whatever you turn to in pain, whatever you turn to to comfort yourself, whatever you turn to to soothe whatever emotional problems you have, that is actually what you put your faith and hope in. We put our hope in many things, but nothing other than Christ will stand. Hope in Scripture is not just a wishful thinking, but a sure and certain foundation based on the promises of God. Let us turn to one of our Scriptures. We have two Scriptures this morning. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse number 50. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We... We, the redeemed people of God, are looking forward to that kingdom of God, that last day when God completes hope. He finishes hope because we won't need to hope for anything any longer. We'll have the promise fulfilled. But how do we get there? How do we get to that kingdom of God? It says it is not by flesh and blood. We don't get the promises of the kingdom merely because of our birth. We don't get the promises of the kingdom merely by our human actions and strivings. There's a lot of talk nowadays of, well, we need to bring the kingdom of God. And while we want to advance his kingdom, God is the one ultimately who will bring his kingdom to bear. Be the reason why is because perishable things can't inherit imperishable things. He uses the word of inheritance a passing down of a legacy from one to another. What do you do to get an inheritance? You don't do anything. You're born and an inheritance is bestowed upon you at the death of someone else. Well, so too, as Jesus Christ died, he bestowed upon us an eternal inheritance that is imperishable. It cannot pass away. Every single thing in this world, in this planet, will pass away. It will burn with fire. And that ought to change how we think and how we live, how we interact with this world and what we have hope in. He continues in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. You like mysteries of what's going to happen? Well, he's going to tell you one. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, when he uses sleep there, it's a euphemism for death. We're not all going to physically die. But every single one of us who are in Christ will be changed. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Suddenly, without Warning, without notice, without uh, advanced um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, notice to us, Christ will return. And he even gives us a time frame, those of you who are uh, end times buffs, he says, at the last trumpet. We have overcomplicated, you see, the plan of God and how God works and interacts with history and how he's going to bring this whole thing to wrap it up in the last day. 
we have this age that we have now that we live in, but we're looking for the age to come. And there will be a final declaration from God when he will come and set everything right. Now, many people have all kinds of graphs and charts, and charts as long as this stage possibly could be, of all the little nicks and ticks of what it's going to, how it's going to happen and how it's going to pan out. But the real lesson we get from this is that right now we live in the age of the perishable. And what we're looking forward to is the age of the imperishable that Christ will bring. He says in verse 53, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Just this past week I was on call, and I got called in the night, and I had to... Uh, get dressed and, and go down to Temple Terrace to the, the hospice house that was there. A person had died, which that is pretty routine in my line of work. W what wasn't you routine is that when I got there, there was nobody there. There was no family members. They couldn't come. The wife wasn't able to come. And so I walk in, and there's simply a dead body there. So I go out to the nurse and say, okay, well, there's nobody here. What do you, what do you want me to do? And they say, well, the nurse really wanted you to pray. So I started to ask questions about the patient, who this patient was. What I learned was this patient was a devout believer in Jesus Christ. He had put his faith and trust in Jesus. He, he, he looked towards him for his hope, for his stay, that even through his illness, he was the one, Jesus was the one that he called upon and looked towards. So I went back in that room, me in a dead body alone, and I read the 23rd Psalm, and I prayed to God, and I prayed to God realizing that one day I may be in that exact same place where everything in my body is shut down and the empty shell is left behind, but because he put his faith and trust in Jesus, he has a promise that one day he will rise again. That's not the end of his story. And so I sat there pondering the blessedness of the resurrection, that as we can look at something that seems lifeless, like there's nothing there, in fact, because of the promise of God, there is more life to come there than people that are alive but lost now. We can live your life not believing in Jesus Christ as a dead person. But we who are asleep, even though we die, yet shall we live. In fact, not just living by the skin of our teeth. Not just a barely living. He says death is swallowed up in victory. There, there's this horrible thing called death. And ultimately we look at all the problems of the world and think what is the, the worst that is to come? Death encapsulates them all. And everything we look to as Christians is the salvation of that curse that was placed upon us. Well, death, victory swallows it up, gobbles it up. And so he gives something. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He's taunting death. So many are afraid of death. They fear death. It's something that uh, is like the boogeyman to them. In fact, what do we do in our society and in our culture? We trivialize it. Most of the times when we see death, it's, it's in a comical manner, or, we, or it's in video games where you <laughs> mow down thousands of people and it means nothing. It's, it's, it's pointless to us. But death is actually something that takes everything of who you are, yet in Jesus Christ there is victory. Death, where's your victory? What are you? It taunts death. It laughs at death. It mocks death. Because the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is bigger than death is. It says the sting of death is sin. Why do we even have death in the first place? Because of sin. In coffee talk, we're going over the, the story, which is that we have a 
creation and a fall, redemption, and then there's recreation after that. Mankind sinned. And the punishment for sin is death. Not just the punishment, as if it's imposed on us. The wages, it says in Romans, of sin. The payment that it gives you. If you want to work for a wage in your job, this is what sin pays. It pays you death. It pays you death as you live in this life by taking away everything that matters, by making the world colorless and bland, but it also takes away your very life in the end. The power of sin is the law. The law is holy. How is there power in sin in the law? Because we know sin by the law. Just as Adam and Eve in that garden knew the law of God, you shall not touch that tree, sin became awakened in them. The temptation of don't do that grew even more. Just like the child in the, the kitchen You say, whatever you do, do not touch those cookies, and instantly those cookies become the only thing that they can possibly think about. The very forbiddenness of the thing incites in us sin, and it shows how sinful we are. We know something is for our own good, and yet we want the thing we know that will destroy us. A sinful heart is like a moth to a flame. He continues, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the labor, the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So he just talked about these end time realities of Jesus Christ coming from the clouds and the last trumpet and the dead in Christ raising to meet with him and we'll have the imperishable bodies. But he didn't stop there. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to that. But in verse 58 he says, Therefore, brothers, this truth ought to change how you live now. If we look at the end times as merely something that is neat theological trivia, then we've missed the point. Whenever we see what God does in the end, it ought to change our present. So what do we do? We remain steadfast. We remain immovable to the tides of this world. We abound in the work of the Lord. What does this mean? It consumes us. Knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. There are many things in this world that are vanity. Ecclesiastes talks a lot about them. And we buy into them often. We could think, well, what would be great? Well, what, what, what if you became a, a YouTube influencer? I hate the term influencer, by the way. It's stupid. But anyway. <laughs> you become one of those people. And you have a million followers and all these people that, that track every word that you have to say. You know, that's vanity. It's going to pass away. It's meaningless. What if I race to the top of my career? I become a, a CEO and, and make tons of money every year. That too can pass away. You can work hard at many things, becoming a, a wonderful uh, the top Pinterest poster where you can make houses out of pallets. But that too will pass away. The only thing that will not, the the labor of your hands, is your labor that you work for the Lord. What you do for him is not in vain. So, what tempts us to not be steadfast? What tempts us to not be immovable, to lead us away from this work that God has given us to do, waiting for his return? It's because we put our hope in the wrong thing. You see, every worldview has this same story of creation, and sin, redemption, and recreation. The trick is, is that the different worldviews have a different idea of what sin and redemption is. 
For us, we understand that sin is the violation of the law of God. It's missing that mark that is set for us. And redemption only comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who took on our punishment, died for us, and rose again from the dead, so that if we put our faith and trust in him, we will be saved. That is why the Bible presents it. However, other worldviews have different ideas of what sin is, what's wrong with this world. Some say it is ignorance is what's wrong with this world. People don't know enough stuff. The reason they act this way, the reason that people hate each other, the reason that there are wars, the reason that there are riots, is because people are ignorant. And so what's their means of redemption? Well, education. We need to educate people more. We need to teach them more things. And, and therefore, when they learn more stuff, well, then they won't do all these, these horrible things. Education, however, while it may fill the mind with facts, will not change a sinful heart. Well, some say, okay, well, fine. The, the, the sin of our society that drags us down, it's, it's economic inequality. And so the, the hope that we put it in is the economy. We need to make a good, strong, vibrant economy, and then all the social ills will melt away. Then homelessness and fatherlessness and, and, and alcoholism and all the things, if we just had a good, vibrant, strong economy, all that stuff will go away. Unfortunately, as we see in Hollywood, those that have tons of money still have tons of problems. And what the soul needs and the soul longs for cannot be filled with dollars and cents. It still longs for something that that can never fill. And so we have people with tons of money overdosing on drugs in mansions filled with everything they could possibly want because the economy, money, isn't the answer to what ultimately the human heart needs. They say, okay, well, the problem then, our hope then, needs to be in politics, in legislation, and in law. Beloved, if you have your hope in politics, you have a very poor hope. We have just seen that what does, the, what does law even do? Law entices sin. And so the more laws you have, the more enticement to sin you have. The fact is, is that human beings, which is all politics is, human beings making up a bunch of rules, can never solve the world's problems. And you know why? Because for about 5,000 years, human beings have been trying to make utopias. We've been trying to make the perfect societies, and every single one of them has failed. Some hope in military might, meaning that if we have strong armies and tanks and, and uh, fighter jets that we can secure our borders indefinitely, then we will have hope and peace. All we need to look for is the very Roman Empire, the height of military might, and it was the corruption inside of themselves that made the Roman Empire collapse. Military might cannot bring hope. Okay? What about science? What about learning more stuff and technology? And, and how, uh, there's, uh, I watched a documentary just recently where uh, Elon Musk has his hopes and making uh, colonies on Mars, because then we can leave all this stuff on this earth behind, and we can go have our utopia over in Mars thanks to technology. You know what that's going to mean? There's just going to be wars on Mars then. All technology does is make it easier for us to kill each other. All technology does is make new ways for us to impose our will on other people. Sure, it may have started with sticks and stones when we were hunter-gatherers, and now it's atom bombs and uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. But sinful hearts use science, which science isn't bad, to fulfill our own sinful desires. Okay, we don't put our hope in education or the economy or politics or military might or science. Some of us put our hope in family. Well... Maybe if it's none of those external things, all my fulfillment, 
all my longing, all the things that I seek and try to fulfill in my soul, maybe my family can do that for me. Maybe my kids can do that for me. Or if you're single, maybe my future husband and wife, maybe they could fulfill the deep longing in my soul. Beloved, they will not and cannot. Human beings will always fail other human beings. Family is a good thing. It's a gift of God. It's a blessing of God. But that does not ultimately bring our hope. Our friends as well cannot bring us hope. Friends betray us. Friends run out on us. Even Jesus, who looked at his disciples and says, you are, I call now my friends, had Judas in that very crowd that betrayed him for money. He said, you know what? I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need hope in education or the economy or politics or military might or science or my family or my friends. I have hope in myself. I don't need anybody. I look to myself for my hope. I'll make my own dreams. I'm captain of my own ship. My destiny is in my own hands. Yet you can't escape death. And so all that hopes and dreams and meaning making that you think you do on yourself, it just goes away with you. Just as the blow and, and all the seeds fly into the sky, so too your life and your dreams and your hopes, when you die, it all just flutters away. Putting hope in yourself is a very poor hope. Turn to Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse number 18. You see, we put our hope in these things Because we go through, even as Christians, hard times. And anyone that's in pain wants to be relieved of pain. And so we look for solutions to these things. And surely, for some problems, education is a solution. For some problems, economy and finances is a solution. For some problems, politics is a solution. But for the ultimate problems that we face in this world, the only true hope we have is from God. So what does he say of sufferings? Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The, the sufferings of this time. Think about who's even making this. Paul the Apostle. He was suffered, he, he, he was beaten for Christ, he was thrown in prison for Christ, he was shipwrecked for Christ, his name was slandered for Christ, he was arrested for Christ, he knew something about suffering, he bled, literally, in these beatings for Jesus, being persecuted for him. And we too know suffering. We know pain, we know loss of friendships, we know loss of family relationships, we know sickness. We know stress, we know anxiety, we know all the terribleness of this world has to bring. And what does he say? It's not worth even comparing it to the glory that's going to come. The worst thing that could ever happen to you in this life isn't comparable to the glories that comes from hope in God. It says in verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This very planet moans and groans for Christ to return. It longs for him. If the rocks could cry out and the trees could speak and, and the animals could talk to us, it's groaning at this time. For creation, it says, was subjected to futility. It's futile, it's pointless, it's purposeless. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory 
of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we groan, waiting for this revelation to come. Just as in the Garden of Eden, all of earth was put under a curse because of what happened. So too, there is a time when all the earth will be set free through Christ, who are of the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? One day we will see. And one day hope will pass away because we won't need it anymore. We'll have the reality of what that hope is. But right now we await this complete final adoption as sons. We are the first fruits of the Spirit living right now in the blessings that are to come, even more so in the future. And so we groan because what we want isn't what we have. We want a world of peace and love and holiness and righteousness that honors Christ, and yet what we have, we have this world. And so we groan and we wait and we eagerly with expectation. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So as we long for this hope to come, the hope that God will finish, that God will complete, what do we do? What do we do while we wait with patience? Let me give you three things in about three minutes, and then we'll close. What does it mean to wait with patience? You worship God. You go to church. You sing songs to him like we sing. You pray to him when we pray. You attend to the preaching of the word. You attend to the Lord's Supper. This is steadfastness of what can I do to follow God? You, you show up for church. That seems simple. It seems like nothing, but it's the most significant thing that can happen in your life. You say, well, I wake up, I don't feel like it. Well, beloved, I don't feel like it all the time either. But it's through the, not just the instantaneous, I feel like this, I have an emotional high sort of thing, but through the years. That consistent, steadfast faithfulness of hearing the sermons, of taking of the Lord's Supper, of praying and singing together, it changes us ever so slowly. You know, if you were to go out and grow a garden, and you were to plant in the, the, the seed in the ground and put your water on the seed and then stare at it, nothing's going to happen. Where's my instantaneous, you know, bushel of cucumbers? Why isn't it here? But over the slow, faithful tending of that plant, then it brings forth fruit. And so too is it with church. We have coming in out of this pandemic, and what it has done is it has exacerbated a problem that was in the root heart of many in our culture already, many who call themselves Christian. And that problem is, well, you know what? I can worship God in my own way, in my own time, without church. And let me be clear, when I say church, I don't mean the four walls, I mean us as a congregation. I don't need other people to worship God. It's me, God, and that's, that's it. That's all. The Bible knows of no such religion. The Bible consistently has the one another's. It consistently has the we in the uh, admonitions in the epistles. It always assumes a Christian is with other Christians. You are now forming some other strange religion outside of the Bible to say that it is simply me by myself and I don't need the church. So what do we do when we, we go to church? We learn. We worship God, we learn, you get where this is going. We read our Bible, we 
We get connected to other believers and learn together with believers. We, we determine we're not going to be scared of words like theology. We're going to dive into those things. We're going to see what God has to tell us in his word because it's not, serving God isn't just whatever I feel like giving to God. It's learning who he is, what he expects, and what he wants. We need to read, and sometimes reading the Bible, we might not understand it all. It's okay, read it anyway. Ask questions, underline it. No one knows everything. And it's okay to say, you know what? I don't understand everything about the Bible. I don't either. But together, we work through this to learn more about him. And when we learn, then we serve. We worship God. We learn about God. We serve him. We are active in our vocations, serving God in uprightness in our jobs and with our employers, our employees, and also in our own personal ministries, using the gifts that he has given us this is what it means to wait with patience and steadfastness. And when you do these things, ever so slowly, like a tiny sprig of a plant that ever so slowly grows, the hope that comes from God, the hope that God will finish, will grow in your heart. And you will be immovable and steadfast. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that because of you, you have given us a hope. A hope not based on human activity, but a hope completely and utterly based on you and your activity. That this hope isn't something that we have to do to get, it's something you have already done. It is something that you have placed in our hearts, that you have let us be able to call out in faith to you in order to obtain this blessed hope. So Lord, now let us walk in this hope that you've already gifted us with. Let us be attentive to the things of God, not because we're trying to earn something from you, but Lord, because we're thankful that you've already given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, as we now turn to the Lord's Supper, let us remember that this is a blessed picture of that hope, that feast that is to come. Let us be steadfast and immovable as we wait for that feast, that marriage feast, in heaven above and in the new heaven and the new earth. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.